Though Constantinople was recovered 50 years later, Byzantium would never recover from the blow. Meanwhile, foreign traders would retain complete control over both the economy and the Byzantine market. Another unresolved problem in Byzantium was corruption and oligarchy. The government warred with them continually and was for a long time quite effective. Bureaucrats and financial schemers who had gone too far were punished and exiled, their possessions completely confiscated and given to the treasury. However, the authorities never really had the strength and resolve to check this evil systematically. Oligarchs gathered whole armies under the pretext of servants and guards and plunged the government into the thick of civil wars. How did these oligarchs emerge in Byzantium? And why did they become uncontrollable? Byzantium had always been a strictly centralized, bureaucratic government. However, this was by no means its weakness, but rather its historical strength. All efforts to combine authority with personal interest were cut off firmly and decisively. However, during one moment in the period of political and administrative reforms, the temptation arose to exchange the old and seemingly awkward bureaucratic machinery for something more effective and flexible, in which the government's role would be limited and relegated to that of an overseer of formal legalities. To put it simply, the government, out of good intentions and with its eye upon European experience, in fact willingly relinquished a portion of its strategic monopolistic functions, handing them over to a small circle of families. However, contrary to the government's expectations, this new aristocracy it was feeding did not remain long under the control of the bureaucratic apparatus. Resistance continued with alternating success and ended in a serious political crisis, out of which the government could escape only at the price of irreversible concessions to foreigners. We know what happened after this. The oligarchic corruption of the government continued up until the very takeover of Constantinople by the Turks. Incidentally, the oligarchs not only failed to provide the government with money or arms during this final invasion by the Turks, but even grabbed what little was left in the treasury. When the young Sultan Mehmed took the city, he was shocked at the exorbitant wealth of some citizens, while the city's army was completely lacking. He summoned the richest citizens and asked them a simple question. Why did they not provide any money for the city's protection from the enemy? We were saving these funds for your Sultanic Majesty, was their flattering answer. Mehmed had them punished immediately in the cruelest manner. Their heads were chopped off and their bodies were thrown to the dogs. Those oligarchs who fled to the west hoping to hide their capital were mercilessly fleeced by their western friends and ended their lives in poverty. A huge problem of the Byzantine government during the period of decline was its frequent change in political direction, which could be called a lack of stability and succession in governmental powers. With each change of emperors, the empire's direction would often change drastically. This weakened the country severely and cruelly exhausted the population. Political stability is one of the most important conditions for a strong state. This was the testament of the great Byzantine emperors. However, they began to disregard this testament. There was a period when a new emperor was in power every four years, on the average. Could it have been possible under such conditions for the country to undergo a revival or complete any large-scale state projects, projects which would have required many years of systematic effort? Of course, there were also very strong emperors in Byzantium. One example was Basil II, who was, by the way, Grand Prince Vladimir's godfather. He took on the empire's rule after a serious crisis. The country had been practically privatized by oligarchs. First of all, he took tough measures to enforce a vertical power structure. 
quelled all separatist movements in outlying territories and suppressed rebellious governors and oligarchs who were preparing to dismember the empire. Then he purged the government and confiscated huge sums of stolen money. Basil II's strict measures allowed him to build up the state treasury to unprecedented sums. The empire's annual income was 90 tons of gold during his reign. As a comparison, Russia reached such levels only towards the beginning of the 19th century. Basil significantly weakened the mighty regional oligarch magnates. These local sovereigns' influence and power were at times incomparable greater than that of the official governors. Once, during a military campaign, the Asia Minor magnate, Eustathius Malenus, demonstrably invited Emperor Basil and his troops to rest at his estate, and was easily able to accommodate this huge army until they had sufficiently recuperated. This oligarch seriously hoped to influence the country's fate. He began his intrigues, then moved his own puppet candidate forward to the upper levels of authority. Later, he would pay dearly for this. All of his vast property was confiscated, and he himself was sent to one of the most distant prisons in the empire. After the rebellion of another magnate, Bardo Skleros, was put down, Skleros even advised Basil II, in a candid discussion, to exhaust the magnates with taxes, special taxes, and governmental service so that they would not have time to get so rich and powerful. Having restored the verticality of authority in the country, Basil left a sort of stabilization fund to his successor, which was so large that in the words of Mikhail Pselos, he had to dig new labyrinths in the underground treasury stores. The National Reserve was designated first of all for military reforms and the organization of a professional capable army. Byzantium in general had quite a problem with her successors. Although the Byzantines were the greatest specialists in the world in the area of world succession. They did not have the principle of inheritance to the throne. Wishing to ensure that power succeed to a worthy heir, the emperors usually chose one or two candidates and actively drew them into governmental affairs, delegated high and responsible positions in the government to them, and observed them. There was even a system whereby the country would have at one time an emperor and so-called junior emperors, the heirs. This was all very reasonable, but no matter how well they honed the system of succession, in the final analysis it became clear that it was simply the luck of the draw.